Yeah, not as extreme as the Chinese situation. We keep getting new data out of China that indicates that it's just getting worse by the day. Uh, but Germany, this is their last decade as an industrial power as well. They're simply not going to have the workforce to continue to the attempt. So Switzerland does have a younger demographic than Germany. They have a minimum 20 extra years. Uh, that doesn't mean that their future is particularly bright in the long term, but they've got a lot of time to potentially figure something out. And they're going to learn a lot from what the Germans do or don't do. Uh, France has the healthiest demography in the region. A lot of this is going to be picked up by the French. Now, yes, the French are not capable of doing German style precision manufacturing, but that doesn't mean they're a slouch. Uh, as for the Central Europeans, most notably the Poles, the demographic situation is similar, but they're all 15 years younger. So there's, again, another couple of decades. So you'll see this system break up and a lot of people leave just like they did the last time that the Germans faced a major geopolitical stress back in the 1840s. Remember, we got a million Germans uh, in like a four year period from out migration. You're probably going to see something very similar again. The trick, of course, is whether the United States can um, fix its immigration system between now and when this break really happens so that we can take advantage. I hope it does. In the case of Germany, theoretically, emphasis on the word theoretically, it might be able to use immigration in some way. The scale of what necess is necessary would be huge, though. You need to bring in two to three million people under age 25 a year for the next 20 years. And if you do that, Germans are no longer a majority in their own country. So, you wow. know, the cultural that, transformation. Yeah, that's, that's the rub. That's the, that's yeah. the cultural transformation of doing it so late in the day makes it much, much harder. So Canada is an example of a country that did it before. So the Canadian demography was very similar to the German demography 15 years ago. And so they started up a massive inward migration program under the Harper government, continued it under Trudeau. And I don't mean to suggest that they've solved it, but they've provided an interesting case study for how it doesn't have to change you. Uh, the United States has a much healthier demography than Canada had 15 years ago. Uh, and is generally the destination for a lot of countries who want or people who want a better life. So we can theoretically make the decision to do this at scale. But the countries that we would reach to for that are now very different. So Mexico has been so economically successful over the last 30 years that net migration from Mexico to the United States has now been flat to negative for 15 years. And with NAFTA, they've industrialized and their birth rate has dropped. And so now they are a destination country for inward migrants as well. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time in U.S. history, we've got Canada, the United States and Mexico who are all on the same side when it comes to migration issues. That's a very different conversation that's being had now compared to just five years ago. Uh, most of the migrants we're getting are coming from failing states. El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Cuba, and uh, most recently, uh, Venezuela. The numbers, the apolitical numbers are obvious. We need these people. The politics are obviously more of a problem. And in that, the issue absolutely has been Donald Trump because he's done two things. Number one, he's closed down almost all methods for legal migration. So it doesn't matter if you don't know how to clean a window. It doesn't matter if you can design a supercomputer. You have to come illegally if you want to come to the United States. It's like, so all the people that we say that we want, we're saying they can't come either. Second, he built the wall. Now, the wall is going through the border zone, which is the most remote part of the American continent. The Chihuahuan and the Sonoran Deserts are some of the greatest natural barriers in the world. And by building the wall, he has built 50 con um, construction roads across this barrier in order to build something that's 20 to 30 feet tall. Well, I, I ask you this, if you can quadruple your income by using a ladder once, wouldn't you? Especially now that on the other side of that ladder is a road. are roads. Yeah. So Donald Trump functionally has been the most pro-illegal migrant president we've ever had. Now, the Biden administration is, if anything, as hostile to migration because he's attempting to bring the unions into his political coalition. Part of this whole, our pol politics are a mess, is that some of the factions have broken away already and the unions are one of them. And they, as a rule, are the first or the second most anti-migration group in the country. So no one in Washington wants to talk about meaningful immigration reform until we know where the unions are going to land. That's mm -hmm. not gonna be this year or next year. Yeah, and, and most- that way. 
And for most, it's too late. I mean, China is just too big. They could absorb all of the world's willing migrants, assuming the migrants wanted to go there, uh, and it wouldn't be enough to move the needle. Um, Canada is a very special case. Their percentage of foreign born is triple that of the countries in second place. And it's, it's, a, it's a tie between us and Australia and New Zealand and Argentina, where we're all at right around 3%, whereas the Canadians are at about 10. Well, there's always the, the linear forecast fallacy. The idea is that the last 20 years had this percentage of growth, so the next 20 years will be that percentage of growth. I mean, by that logic, we're all going to be Nigerian by the year 2150. Um, it's so, you know, that's number one. Uh, number two, there is there's a lack of understanding of the degree to which China is a technological power. And even for semiconductors, you know, forget the high-end stuff, which the Chinese can't even pretend to make. Like the low-end stuff between like 70 and 90 nanometer, things are just like step, a barely a step over the Internet of Things. Yes, the Chinese make a lot of those. But with imported equipment and imported software and imported labor, uh, the skill sets of the Chinese just have not improved much. Uh, labor costs have gone up by a factor of 14 in the last 22 years. But worker productivity has barely doubled. So China is no longer the low cost producer and they were never able to become the high tech producer. They do low end, they do assembly. That is not nothing. That is an essential piece of the process, but it's not a dominant part of the process. And that is the easiest part to move. And so what we've been seeing in just the last couple of months is foreign net and or foreign direct investment is now negative because people are realizing that there, you don't, put your people at risk. You don't put your capital at risk in a system that now criminalizes due diligence. Uh, it's The story is in the process of turning. China has size and that matters, but that's not the only factor. Uh, now that we're losing those network effects, I think that the pace that we move out of China is going to be three and four times the pace that we moved into China. And to be perfectly blunt, it needs to be because if we can't build out the industrial plant in North America before the Chinese system breaks, then we have to do it without Chinese gear. And that's going to make everything a lot more difficult. Than the politics are, are not just a sideshow. That is very real. The national security side of this is relevant. But we've never, ever in human history seen a country face this sort of demographic collapse. Uh, even if we decided to actively assist the Chinese in everything they do, this is still their last 10 year period. So we talked about Putin being, you know, what happens if his back is up against the wall? Mm -hmm. What about Xi? Well, that's the problem. We don't know. Um, there's this great story uh, that I was told once um, that uh, basically you remember back in um, January, just before the Ukraine war started, when the United States was releasing this intelligence that not a lot of people believed about what the Russians had planned up to and including the day that the war was going to start. Well, it turns out that we had found a way to weasel our, our intelligence system into their secure rooms where there were basically giant safes where there was no eavesdropping possible. There were no electronics, but we managed it anyway because Putin has an inner circle. Some of them are even competent. There's people he discusses things with. So there are phones you can tap and there are faxes you can read and emails you can hack. And it turned out their information security was not as good as we thought it was. And so we just shared it with everybody. There's nothing like that in China. It's not because they have better IT protection. It's actually much worse than the Russians. But Xi doesn't speak with anyone.